I think that's it for uh, for an, for announcements. Before we get started this evening, let's have a few moments of silent prayer so we can make sure that we are in fellowship and ready to study the Word and focus upon God's grace and God's provision and a greater understanding of His plan and purpose for us, especially as church-age believers. So we'll have a few moments of silent prayer before we begin. Then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to come together this evening to study your word, and we just pray that you will open our eyes to the truth of your word, that we'll come to understand the tremendous uh, blessings and benefits that we have as believers in this church age. Father, we also pray for folks in this congregation that are going through personal challenges. There are folks who are going through uh, challenges related to their health. There are folks who are going through challenges related to finances. There are folks who are facing uh, difficulties and diseases that uh, are ultimately fatal, and we pray that they might have uh, strength and endurance. They might be faithful witnesses to those who care for them. They they might be faithful witnesses to their friends and to their family, and they might have a a tremendous testimony uh, to your grace. Now, Father, we pray that as we study this evening that you would help us and strengthen us in our understanding of your word, that we might uh, be more adept, more prepared, and more faithful in the way in which we handle and utilize your word in our day-to-day lives. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we've been going through a our study on God's plan for the ages. And now we are starting in the church age. So I want you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, and we're starting a study on the distinctives of the church age or the dispensation of grace. Uh, just as kind of a an interesting note, before we get started, the last two lessons that we've covered have been rather intense and rather detailed, especially as we have gone through some new material related to how the uh, Old Testament is used in the New Testament. And I have taught there are four basic ways that are evident in Jewish uh, in Jewish interpretation from the first century and how the Old Testament or how the Scripture was quoted and interpreted. I've taught that many times. I taught it uh, several times as we were going through the book of Acts. I taught it in Matthew and other studies that we've gone through. But I took the on the second example, which is a, a historical event that is used as a type, and I added a new layer to that this last time, going back and looking at the uh, comparison in the in the uh, second and third Balaam oracles. And the purpose for that was to show that the Bible really uses this and sets up Israel as a type, the nation as a type of the king. Uh, which was a new layer of information and a new layer of, of study uh, complexity on that particular uh, that element of, of interpretation. Now, I originally learned this, these four areas of interpretation from Arnold Fruchtenbaum uh, back in the 70s. Uh, Charlie Clough would have Arnold Fruchtenbaum come and talk to his church up at Lubbock Bible Church. And that's where I first learned about Ar- Arnold Fruchtenbaum. That was the first time I learned that. And as I studied that, I saw this was a tremendous way to come to an understanding uh, of these particular passages. Well, as you all know, Arnold is a tremendous scholar especially in helping all of us understand the Jewish and the Hebrew background to understanding the New Testament. One of Arnold's uh, protégés is is Michael Rydelnik, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, Michael Rydelnik went to Dallas Seminary, started in the uh, 79, finished, I think, in 83, worked for Ariel Ministries for Arnold for a number of years before he went on to his teaching career at Moody Bible Institute, his current position as the chairman of the Jewish Studies Department. Uh, A few years ago, uh, Michael wrote a book, I think it was three years ago it came out, called, and the title is, Is the Hebrew Bible Messianic? dealing with this whole problem that has infiltrated a lot of evangelical scholarship, that basically there's no messianic prophecy in the in the Old Testament. Michael's done a tremendous job working with that, and in one of his chapters, 
He deals with those four ways in which the Old Testament uh, passages are quoted by the New Testament, and he does uh, did a much better job of that, developing that and, and presenting it in a much more scholarly, academic way than Arnold had. I mean, he, he which is needed to give that documentation support for all the different uh, different things that you're alleging as you argue for that position. And Arnold had read, had been given a copy of the book and wrote an endorsement for the book when it first came out, but he just sort of skimmed through the book. And I was talking with Michael yesterday, asking him some questions relative to, to uh, what, we've, what we recently studied, and Michael told me that he, has, he got a letter from Arnold about a year ago. That, and Arnold, uh, some of you know Arnold, and you've heard him speak, and Arnold's not one to be real effusive with his compliments. And he wrote a, an effusive, complimentary letter of praise to Rydelnik about how wonderful the book was because Arnold finally got around to reading the whole book. And what's interesting for us is Arnold told Michael, he said, I never put together and understood the significance of those two Balaam oracles. That's what everybody here sort of tripped over. He said, from now on, I'm teaching it. He said, that was the best explanation of that principle that I've ever heard, and it will forever change the way in which I teach this particular topic. So I just thought you would uh, like to know that additional information. All of us, many of us, Mike Rydelnik, um, Arnold, Tommy Ice, Randy Price, uh, have known each other for many, many years, and, and along with a number of others, and we, you know, no one man can maximize or become an expert in every area. And it's really been exciting over the years to see how we have all sort of uh, fed off of each other and stimulated each other and helped each other in different areas working through our understanding of the Scripture. And that's the body of Christ at a pastoral level uh, work, working together. And so that's been fun. That just gives you a little insight into that. Okay, we're moving past the Old Testament. We're coming into the New Testament, and we're specifically looking at the beginning of the church age. And the church age begins in Acts chapter 2. And so I just want to run through in a uh, categorical, outline manner, the basic characteristics of the church age. So first of all, the scripture. The scripture that covers the church age in the New Testament begins in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, and extends through Revelation chapter 3. Remember, Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 contain the seven letters to the seven churches. At the end of chapter 3, there's no longer a mention of the church until you get to the end after the tribulation. So there is no mention of the church because the church is absent from the earth during the period of the tribulation. So this section, Acts, is the historical uh, narrative on the foundation and expansion of the church through the power of God the Holy Spirit. We just studied the entire book of Acts on Tuesday night before we began this, this series on dispensations. The epistles that are written, all of the epistles in the New Testament, are written to explain the dynamics of the church age. The information that is given in those epistles from Romans to Jude is information that for much of it is different but built on that of the Old Testament because the spiritual life of the church age is different. In the Old Testament, they anticipated the coming of a Messiah. They anticipated the coming of the Savior. In the church age, we look back to the completion of our uh, the payment for sin and all that has been done for us. In the Old Testament, they did not know of the personal ministry of God the Holy Spirit in the life of every single believer. But in the church age, we have various ministries of God the Holy Spirit that are true for every single believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's the foundation for our spiritual life. So the spiritual life of the church age doesn't look back 
to the age of Israel, doesn't look back to the Mosaic law at all for the precedent, for the framework for understanding the spiritual life. And that's so critical. And in many denominations and many theological frameworks, and basically all theological frameworks other than dispensationalism, they look to the Old Testament as the precedent for... um, for the Christian life, which means they look to the law as if it has some sort of direct impact on the on Christianity, and it doesn't. There is a clean break. Something new happens on the day of Pentecost that had never happened before, that was not even uh, predicted uh, in the Old Testament at all, that was completely unknown, and that was based not on the precedent of the age of Israel and the Mosaic Law and the spiritual life under Israel, but is based upon the foundation of the ministry and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. He not only fulfilled the law, which we've studied in Matthew 5.17, he not only fulfilled the law, but he also, by virtue of his relationship with God the Holy Spirit and his humanity, laid the foundation for the spiritual life of the of the church age. One of the things we studied in Hebrews uh, many years ago when we went through our study of Hebrews was to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ did not live his his humanity on the basis of any of his divine powers. It was as it were there, there was as it were a firewall between his deity and his humanity. There's no intermingling of the divine attributes and the human attributes. Now there were times that Jesus did things that demonstrated that he was fully God from his omnipotence he was able to change the water into wine. From his omnipotence, he was able to still the storms on the Sea of Galilee. From his omnipotence, he was able to walk on the water. But these were not things that he did to solve personal problems and spiritual problems in his humanity. They were things that he was doing to demonstrate that he was who he claimed to be, that he was also the eternal God made flesh, incarnate, who had come to the earth to fulfill the promises related to the Messiah. But in his spiritual life, as a human being, he faced the challenges that we all face, temptations, for example, at the beginning of his ministry, when he demonstrates his qualifications for his ministry, he was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness where he is tempted or tested by Satan uh, three times, and it's that testing or temptation it, when he passes it that shows his qualifications to be the Messiah. But he doesn't pass those temptations because by relying upon his divine attributes. He relies upon them as a human being by utilizing the same resources that you and I have, the Word of God and the Spirit of God. So we can't ever fall fall into the trap of thinking, well, Jesus could handle it because he was God. No, Jesus never handled any challenge or problem or difficulty in his life because he was God or on the basis of his divine attributes. He handled all of those problems as a human being, setting the precedent for us in the church age by depending upon the Word of God and the Spirit of God. So the the epistles outline this new, this distinct spiritual life that is based upon the indwelling and the filling and of the Holy Spirit, walking by the Spirit and not not by the flesh. So the, the epistles are specifically written to inform us as church-age believers, on how we are to live the Christian life uh, and to tell us what God has provided for us so that we can access these incredible spiritual uh, resources that God has given us. In this dispensation, as in each dispensation, there is a key person. Now, the church is treated as a corporate entity, and the church as a whole is called the body of Christ. It is the body of Christ that is the steward for the church age. But Paul, as it were, is the uh, key person, as, as the key apostle 
to the Gentiles, he is the one that articulates mostly the what is called, and we'll see this and understand this in a minute, the mystery doctrine of the church age. That is, the the information that was revealed related to church age believers that was completely uh, completely unknown in the Old Testament. So the Apostle Paul refers in these scriptures, as we'll see, to the dispensation of grace, the administration of God's grace in this unique way in the church age as having been uniquely and distinctly given to him. Uh, the, the, the church age is called the church age because the dominant uh, uh, entity is the church, the body of Christ. But it is also sometimes called the dispensation of grace. And this comes from John 1.17, which says that the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that verse doesn't mean that, that, that there was no grace or no truth in the Old Testament. Grace and truth are linked together by that uh, conjunction and. Was there truth in the Old Testament? Sure, there was truth in the Old Testament. Everything that God revealed in the Old Testament was absolute truth. So Jesus Christ came along as the ultimate expression of truth, but he's not the first to bring truth. And so you can apply that same line of reasoning to grace. Jesus Christ is not the first to bring grace into God's relationship with the human race. Salvation in the Old Testament wasn't based on law. There were some early dispensationalists who misstated that, but the law was never a basis for salvation in the Old Testament. Salvation in the Old Testament was based on faith alone in Christ alone. They didn't understand the specifics of Jesus of Nazareth, but they understood Christ. The Greek word is Christos, meaning the anointed one. The Hebrew word is Mashiach. They understood the, the, the promise of the Mashiach, who would be the anointed one who would bring deliverance to God's people from sin. And so they're looking forward to a redeemer, the seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15, who would fulfill those promises and bring redemption from sin uh, to the human race. So grace was known in the Old Testament. Truth was known in the Old Testament. But there's a ultimate expression of grace and truth in the incarnation of of the Lord Jesus Christ in the first advent. So because of this, this age is known for grace because in a distinct way, grace is being showcased in the church age because of God's extension of his favor to all of the world, to all the nations, in a way that was never known, not that God wasn't saving Gentiles in the Old Testament, but in a way that was never known in the Old Testament because God was primarily working through Israel. Now, there were many Gentiles that were saved. We know of Jonah going to uh, Nineveh. Uh, Nineveh is um, in the outskirts, the remains of Nineveh on the outskirts of the modern Iraqi uh, city of Mosul. And if you've been following the news, you know that there are ancient Jewish uh, communities that have lived in Mosul going back to uh, 500 years to 600 years before Christ, that there are Christian communities that trace their heritage back to almost the first century in this area of, of the world. And yet these horrible, barbaric Muslims that are uh, marching across Iraq right now and destroying everything of, of cultural value have... Uh, I have taken and stolen the, the homes and the businesses from all the Christians and the Jews who live in these areas, and they are expelling them from the country. They're giving them just a few days to leave, and they can't take anything with them. They're truly losing everything they've ever had. They'll never recover it. They're, they are reduced to zero possessions and being expelled by the peace-loving Muslims. You know, the fact that they're a religion of peace doesn't mean that it's a religion of peace. If you know anything about Islam, you know that the peace is only for those who are in the house of peace, the house of Islam. And you're, if you're in the house of peace, there is peace from Allah for you. But if you are not Muslim, 
if you are not under the authority of Allah, then you are in the house of war. Everybody in the world is either in that one or the other. You're either in the house of peace or the house of war. And if you are in the house of war, then you are to be destroyed. Jihad is declared against you. And if you are a Quran-believing Muslim, then the, the orders in the Quran are to destroy every Jew and Christian on the planet. And that's what Islam is. Anything else, when people talk about moderate Islam, they're not talking about uh, Muslims who actually believe the Quran. But if they believe the Quran, eventually they'll, they'll be pushed to, uh, to jihad. But that is, that's what's happening now. So you had in Assyria, in the, in the ancient world, in Nineveh, you had the whole city repented when Jonah came. They responded to his message, and all those Gentiles uh, turned to uh, the Jewish God and the Jewish Savior in their expectation of eternal life. You had people like Naaman the Syrian, who uh, also was a Gentile who came to uh, salvation. And there were many, many others in the, in the Old Testament. So there was grace that was extended to the Gentiles, but not in the way it is in the New Testament. The New Testament church, the church has primarily a Gentile makeup, even though initially in the first hundred years it was primarily Jewish. Every dispensation has a specific responsibility, or in some cases one or two responsibilities that are to be carried out and fulfilled by the steward. Remember, I pointed out at the beginning that the Greek word that, that from which we get our English word dispensation, the Greek word is oikonomia, meaning a economy or administration, or you have also have the, uh, the word, a variant of the word re- referring to a steward or the person who is responsible for the administration, each dispensation has a responsible uh, por- party or corporate entity. In the age of Israel, and the under the law, the responsible entity was Israel. In the church age, the responsibility is to the church. This is a distinction that we have between Israel and the church, which is one of the dis- primary distinctives of dispensationalism. So there are responsibilities given to the church and to church age believers. And in summary, this is that we are to utilize the power of God the Holy Spirit in our individual spiritual life and to be witnesses to Christ throughout the world, Acts 1.8 you could also say Matthew 28, 19, and 20, the Great Commission. And there is a responsibility we have to the New Covenant to be uh, to proclaim the benefits of that New Covenant, even though it's not in effect today. won't come into effect until the Millennial Kingdom. That's what we're working toward. That is our end game. We know the, you know the old saying, you have to begin with the end in mind. The end for us as church-age believers is the judgment seat of Christ. There we will be given rewards, rewards and responsibilities that will determine our, our role in the millennial kingdom. And so some will have no rewards, some will have a few rewards, and some will have many rewards depending on our faithfulness and our spiritual growth. But the responsibility of the church age is to grow to spiritual maturity, to be a witness for Christ, to be an ambassador for Christ. That's the uh, Second Corinthians chapter 5 emphasizes that. And we are as such ministers of the new covenant, which is what comes into effect in the millennial kingdom when we as the bride of Christ will be ruling and reigning with him in the millennial kingdom. So these are the first four uh, aspects of the church age, the scripture that covers the church age, Acts 2.1 through Revelation 3. The key person who reveals this doctrine is Paul, but Peter, James uh, do as well, Luke, Uh, Matthew, Mark, all reveal significant things related to the church age. Uh, The name as the dispensation of grace comes from John 1.17 and our responsibility to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ by means of God the Holy Spirit and to be a witness throughout the ends of the earth. Now the basic test 
So always in each dispensation, the test is related to the responsibility that God gives us. The basic test for us is, will we walk by the Spirit? In each dispensation, the, the test is really in relation to obedience to God as it is, as, as it is uh, articulated within the covenant in the Old Testament, for the, since there's not a specific covenant for the church age, what we have is the commands and the mandates of Jesus Christ. So the issue is, will man walk in the Spirit and be a witness for Jesus Christ? This is seen in Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 8. And we'll look at Acts 1, Acts through these passages in just a little bit. The failure is that many Christians will become apostate by the end of the age and will fall into false doctrine, embrace false teachers, and like every other dispensation, the steward fails to utilize the resources that God gives them. So the church age ends. The church will never dominate uh, you have you have the view of post millennialism that says that the church grows and grows and grows, and through uh, God the Holy Spirit will eventually all mankind will become saved, and then we'll bring in a utopic period of the kingdom, and after that Jesus comes back. That's called post millennialism because Jesus comes back after the millennium, in, in their view. And because they are so optimistic that everything will eventually get better and better, it may get worse before it gets better, they refer to themselves as optimillennialists. They're optimists. They're optimillennialists. And then they sneer at premillennialists and they call us pessimillennialists because we're looking forward to doom and gloom, so we're a bunch of pessimists. And, re- and the, historically, the opposite is really true. It is premillennialists who have had great hope in the future, because we know that, that even though between now and then there may be uh, dark days, Jesus is coming back to establish his kingdom, and this has stimulated uh, this has stimulated the church to great evangelistic activity. In fact, in the 19th century and 20th century, it's primarily through premillennial uh, pastors and missionaries and evangelists that there has been a great explosion of the gospel around the world. That's not to say that others have not been a part of the expansion of Christianity in the last two centuries. But uh, much evangelism has been speared by premillennialists. In, in fact, um, uh, one of the, uh, the the name escapes me now, but the founder of uh, the Chosen People Ministries wrote his PhD dissertation at um, Fuller Theological Seminary on Jewish evangelism in the early 20th century in Europe, and. Some of his statistics are remarkable, and I can't recall all of them off the top of my head, but in some areas of Eastern Europe, as many as 15% of the Jewish population in the 1920s and 1930s converted to Christianity uh, as they came to understand the gospel. In fact, there were more Jewish believers, Jewish Messianic Jews in Budapest in 1930 than there are Jews living in Houston, Texas. And I believe, because I'm an optimist, that many of those Messianic Jews who understood the gospel went to the gas chambers at Auschwitz and at Treblinka and at many of the other death camps in, in, in Poland, but they went with the gospel of Jesus Christ on their lips and through their witness I believe there were many, many other Jews that were saved during that time, and this is a result. This is a, a extremely unusual, extremely rare area area of study. And Mitch Glazer is the uh, head of the uh, of Chosen People Ministries. This was his doctoral dissertation, but but he's done remarkable, groundbreaking research on on that area. So, but but he said it w- all of this Jewish evangelism was driven by premillennialists and premillennial dispensationalists. So we're not the pessimillennialists that the uh, 
that the post mills claim that we are, we have genuine biblical hope and genuine, genuine biblical optimism based on our understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ and fulfilling the mission, which is to be a witness to all the nations in the world of the, of the gospel. So we emphasize grace. We emphasize grace, which means undeserved favor, unmerited kindness, unmerited blessing, that God deals with us not on the basis of who we are, what we have done, but on the basis of who Jesus Christ is and what he did on the cross. Now, if you can get your mental fingers around what I just said, that ought, that alone ought to change your whole perspective on Christianity. That God deals with us not on the basis of our failures, not on the basis of our sins, not on the basis of our good deeds or our works, but on the basis of Christ's righteousness, on who Jesus Christ is and the fact that we are saved, not because of anything positive we've done, but because we possess the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that means you don't have to do anything to be saved. Uh, So this is the focal point of the gospel. This is grace. And God's grace is specifically demonstrated uh, to the church in that before the tribulation begins, so that doesn't mean there won't be persecution. There's been much persecution of Christians in past centuries. There's a tremendous amount of persecution toward Christians today, especially in Muslim countries. Uh, tremendous hostility. They're, they've been driven out of, of Egypt. They've been, they're now being driven out of Iraq. They're being driven out of Syria. They're being persecuted. They're being killed. They're being martyred. Uh, by these horrible uh, Islamists, but that's nothing compared to what's going to happen in the tribulation period to believers. Now, they're not church-age believers, because God in his grace is going to remove the church from the earth before any part of the tribulation begins, and he will keep us out of that terrible judgment. Uh, There are some Christians who teach a partial rapture view. In other words, if you've been a good Christian, and if you have been a maturing Christian, then you get raptured. But if you're a backslidden Christian or an apostate Christian, then you have to go through the tribulation. And if uh, if you get right with the Lord, then maybe you'll get raptured. So there's some that have these partial raptures all through the tribulation. There's also a view called the mid tribulation view. Again, it's the same kind of thing. And at the core, these folks usually have a problem understanding grace and the fact that Christ paid the penalty for all of our sins at the cross. And there's no sin too great for the grace of God. There's no sin that the omniscience of God of God forgot about and Christ didn't pay for. Every sin was paid for at the cross. So that sin isn't the issue. The issue is, what do you think about Jesus Christ? And that is grace. And so all who are in Christ... All who are members of the body of Christ, by faith alone in Christ alone, are going to be raptured when Jesus Christ returns in the air for the church, and in an instant, in the less than a blink of an eye, we are all going to uh, disappear. We will be bodily resurrected. We will instantly, um, in a nanosecond, you can't even measure how it how it takes place, but in a nanosecond, we'll receive our resurrection bodies. And we will all be joined together in the clouds, in the air with the Lord Jesus Christ. And from there we go to heaven where we receive our rewards at the judgment seat of Christ in preparation for the next stage, which is when we rule and reign with Christ. That's our end game. That's what we're preparing for. The, you can think of the judgment seat of Christ as, as a graduation ceremony. Some people are going to have a high honor. Some people are going to graduate with honor. Some people are going to graduate, and some people are going to graduate just by the hair of their chinny chin chin. They're going to graduate, and it says at the in First Corinthians chapter three that that at the judgment seat of Christ they will enter heaven yet as through fire. Uh, you can almost smell the smoke as they walk by. They're just escaping the uh, uh, hellfire. Uh, but they're saved, but that's it. They've got no rewards because they were failures in their Christian life, but they don't lose their salvation 
They just lose out on the, the maximum blessing they could experience in the, in the judgment seat of Christ. One writer uh, put it this way, that everybody's cup is going to be full. You're going to come out of the judgment seat of Christ, and everyone will have a full cup. Some people are going to have really large cups, and some people are going to have many, many demitas cups. And yet everybody's cup will be full. And if you have a small cup, you're going to be exceptionally happy because your cup is full. And if you have a really, really large cup, you're going to be exceptionally happy because your cup is full. It's just going to have different capacities. So that's what happens as a result of the judgment seat of Christ, all of which we'll go into over the next several lessons. So the parameters of the church age. When does the church age begin, and when does the church age end? Now, this is really important because this relates to understanding Scripture. There are many folks who think that, and usually uh, covenant theology, but also other theological systems, Lutheranism, Roman Catholic theology, all believe that Israel, spiritual Israel in the Old Testament, was the church of the Old Testament. They confuse the church with Israel. So they see the church in the Old Testament and and the church in the uh, Israel in the Old Testament is the church in the Old Testament and the church in the New Testament is spiritual Israel. And so they confuse those two and they don't understand the distinctions between the believer in the Old Testament under the law who did not have the Holy Spirit and church age believers, and all that God has provided for us in grace through the ministry of God the Holy Spirit. So it's important to understand these distinctives, and they relate to understanding the beginning and the end of the uh, church age. So the church began on the day of Pentecost. It didn't begin with Adam. You don't have this spiritual church as far back as Adam. You will run across that if you read very much. You'll hear people say that. But the church did not begin with Adam. It didn't begin in Abraham's tent. Uh, it didn't begin in Abraham's home in Ur the Chaldees or in his tent in the Promised Land. It didn't begin with Moses on Mount Sinai. The church began on the day of Pentecost with the arrival of God the Holy Spirit. This is what is seen in Acts chapter 2. Now, I've asked you to turn to Acts chapter 2, but as background for that, I want to read to you from Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. In Matthew 3, 11, John the Baptist is talking. John the Baptist is down by the Jordan River where he is preaching a message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and he is calling upon those who have repented to indicate this change by water baptism. And then he says to them in verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me, which, which is a reference to the Messiah, he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now when he says he will baptize you, he uses a future tense verb. A future tense verb means that something is going to happen in the future, but it is not happening now. It is something that is a future event. So in Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist says this baptism by the Holy Spirit is future. Okay, then we turn to the first chapter, uh, the first chapter of Acts. This gets into the second point. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is what forms the church, the body of Christ. And this is seen in Acts chapter 1, verse 5. In Acts 1.5, Jesus is speaking. Jesus said, For John truly baptized with water. That's what we just looked at in Matthew 3. See, the whole Bible is interconnected. You can't just read part of it. You have to understand the entirety of the Bible because it's interconnected and interdependent. And if you just go in and grab verses out of context, then you're going to misunderstand because these verses are, are interdependent. So Acts, I mean, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 is the background for what happens in Acts 1-5. Matthew 3-11 happens just before the beginning of Jesus' ministry. In Acts 1-5, Jesus has been crucified. He has been buried. He's been resurrected. He is 
about to ascend to heaven. It's going to happen at the end of this this discussion. By the time we get down to about verse 9 or 10, Jesus is going to ascend to heaven. But here he is repeating what happened at the beginning of his ministry. John truly baptized with water, but you, who's he talking to? He's talking to the 11 disciples. He says, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So from the time of John the Baptist until uh, the until Christ's ascension, how many people were baptized with the Holy Spirit? Zero. Not one. Not one person prior to Acts 2 is baptized by the Holy Spirit. It's future tense in Matthew 3.11. It's future time in Acts 1.5. Now, we'll skip over Acts 2 just for the moment. And we look at Acts 11. We've gone through Acts in the past, and we know that what happened in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, is that Jesus gave them a commissioning. One of the many times he commissioned them in terms of the expansion of the church. And he said, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and then in Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. Now, this is the expansion of the church. So as we went through Acts, we saw that initially the proclamation of the gospel and the repetition of the offer of the kingdom occurred to the Jews in Acts chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And then persecution broke out, and the church was forced to leave Jerusalem because of hostility from the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. So they had to spread out. They went to Judea and to Samaria. They had just stayed together. Uh, and and huddled together in Jerusalem, and God said, okay, if you're not going to fulfill what I told you to do, then I'm going to have to uh, squash you and hit you hard with some discipline, and that will scatter you, and you'll go finally do what I told you to do after you get a little discipline. So then they scattered. They went to Judea and Samaria, and there was tremendous impact, and Peter is now at this time, Peter is living in Joppa, which is would be really a suburb of the modern city of Tel Aviv. Joppa was the old port. It was the port from which Jonah left, uh, fleeing from God so he wouldn't have to take the gospel to those nasty, filthy Gentiles. And he he went on a ship, and then he got a a, a return trip home via a special fish. So he left from Joppa. So Joppa is always associated with God's grace to the Gentiles. When I take groups to Israel, I give them a tour guide, and most tour guides will list all the biblical uh, passages that relate to a particular place, all the things that, I mean, all the things that happen at that place, uh, biblically, historically, etc. I don't go through everything because it overwhelms everybody. But I try to point out the key events that take place in certain, certain locations so that you can connect a key doctrinal point to a key location, because God did not operate in human history apart from uh, space-time events. He's not out in the in the ozone somewhere uh, in some kind of special spiritual dimension. He's always functioning in space-time, concrete human events. And so Joppa is tied to God's grace to the Gentiles. God's grace to the Gentiles is exhibited in the Old Testament by Jonah, who was to take the gospel to the Ninevites. In the New Testament, we see the same thing happen there. Uh, Peter is staying at Joppa at the home of Simon the Tanner, shows God's grace because a tanner was somebody who dealt with dead things. And therefore, he was perpetually ceremonially unclean because he's dealing with with carcasses. So Peter is staying with him, and he had a vision. He had a vision that there are some Gentiles who are going to come and invite you to Caesarea by the sea. Caesarea is one of the first places we usually go on a tour. He's going to take invite you to Caesarea to the home of Cornelius the Centurion. When you get there, you need to... Uh, be welcomed by them. Don't don't be a separatist because as Jews they would never go into the home of a Gentile. And you're going to go and and they are God fearers and you're going to give them the gospel and explain the way of salvation to them and then they're going to be saved because the gospel is going not to the Jew but also to the Gentile. Well, that happens in Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 11, 
Peter goes back to Jerusalem and he's telling the other apostles and the Christians in Jerusalem what God's now doing among the Gentiles. And he describes this in Acts eleven fifteen through 17. He says, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Us at the beginning. When was that? Who's the us? That's us. He's primarily giving this report to the other apostles. So he's talking to them. When did the Holy Spirit fall upon them? Acts chapter 2. When God the Holy Spirit came upon them, that's the beginning. The beginning of what? The beginning of the church. It's not back in the Old Testament with Adam or Abraham or, or Moses. It happened on the day of Pentecost. And, and then Peter said, Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Future tense. That was in Acts 1.5. So he's quoting in Acts 11, he's quoting from what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1. And then he said, If therefore God gave them the same gift, them the Gentiles, the same gift as he gave us when we believed, when did that gift come? When we believed. It really goes back to the church. He's talking about the beginning because many of them became believers. He's got a large audience here, not just the apostles, but he had others who had believed on the day of Pentecost. Gave them the same gift he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I that I could withstand God? So he is make it, makes it very clear that the giving of the Holy Spirit occurs and the beginning of this new age is when that occurred on on the day of Pentecost. Now, several years later, a decade or more later, the Apostle Paul wrote in his epistle to the Corinthians the statement, for by one spirit we were all baptized. Now it's past tense. See, Jesus said in Acts 1-5, you will be in the future baptized by the Holy Spirit. That occurred in 33. This is around 50, 51, 52. Jesus says... Um, I mean, Paul says, we were all baptized by the Holy Spirit. So sometime between 33 and 52, everybody who's a believer in Christ gets baptized by the Holy Spirit. Acts 11 tells us it was at the beginning, at the day of Pentecost. So it's very clear that the church began on the day of Pentecost in A.D. 33, and that this occurred when God the Holy Spirit came Uh, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So I had you open to Acts 2. Let's just look at that as we sort of wrap things up here in a few minutes. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, verse 1 says, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, when we've studied this in the past, I pointed out that the preposition they, that third person plural preposition, has as its antecedent the closest previous plural noun is the 11 apostles at the end of verse 26. Many people make a, an understandable error by thinking that the 120 that were gathered together to to choose or select a, an, an apostle to replace uh, Judas uh, were still hanging out at the same place. But this is several days later. They all wouldn't have room to stay in these uh, small upper rooms. So it's just the, just the 11 uh, that come together on the day of Pentecost, just the apostles, because they're the foundation of the church. So they're all together in one place, and there there came a sound from heaven, sounded like a tornado, filled the whole house, and then there was a visual effect. There appeared a fire over each one of them, and they were all filled by the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other languages. This would be languages they had not not learned, but were legitimate forms of language: uh, Aramaic, Roman, uh, uh, Latin, uh, me, uh, various Mesopotamian uh, dialects, uh, various other uh, dialects, Parthian, uh, some uh, m- perhaps some languages from the Medes and the Persians. But they all. Uh, miraculously were able to communicate in these other languages, and they were describing the gospel, which is stated to be the great things of God. There's a automatic reaction to this. Uh, people are astounded. They, they l- are hearing the gospel presentation from the disciples in all of their different languages, in these different uh, uh, nationalities or ethnic groups, are listed between verse 9 and verse 11. Now, there have been linguistic scholars who've looked at this list, uh, 
and have said that this basically represents 11 different languages. Well, there were 11 different apostles. And so each, of the, each apostle was given a, an ability to communicate the gospel in a language related to one of these linguistic groups that were present in, um, in Jerusalem. But the people who are hearing them are astounded, and they're saying, what does this mean? And others are mocking them, saying, well, they're drunk. It's on, and Peter said, look, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. They haven't had enough time to, to get drunk yet. The stores aren't open. So uh, Peter uh, then explains it in terms of the Old Testament. Verse 16, he says, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, we just spent two lessons talking about how the Old Testament cites how the New Testament cites the Old Testament. We tend to think of a passage like this, well, he's saying that that this is prophetic fulfillment in the same way that Matthew 5.2 says G, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, and Matthew 2 says Jesus was born in Bethlehem. It's a prophetic announcement with a prophetic fulfillment. But what we learned in those last two lessons was that's not always true. There are different ways in which they are are different meanings that they assign to this word fulfill. So there's a typological fulfillment where you have a historical event. Uh, Israel, as a type of the Messiah, came out of Egypt. And and so that was a typical prefigurement of Jesus, the Messianic King, coming out of, of Egypt. And then you have the application of a historical event when the mothers of Israel were weeping over the young men who were being taken as captives to Babylon uh, in Jeremiah, that they were, um, Rachel was weeping for her children, and that this is applied to the weeping of the mothers in, in Bethlehem. I pointed out that, that there was only one thing those two events had in common, and that was weeping mothers. That in the historical event in Jeremiah, uh, the, the, the sons, the children, were not dead. They were being taken off into captivity. They, the mothers would never see them again. Uh, it happened in Ramah, which is where Rachel is buried, north of Jerusalem, uh, whereas uh, Bethlehem was south of Jerusalem. In Matthew chapter 2, the mothers are weeping because their infant sons are dead. So there are no no parallels, no similarities except one thing. And that's what you see in that third usage, which was the uh, Old Testament is applied to a New Testament event, and you have uh, a series of circumstances, only one of which is identical. What the, what the writer is saying is, I'm de- going to demonstrate a point from a, from a similar situation in the Old Testament. And so Joel talks about these incredible things that God the Holy Spirit can do, and that he predicts that there will be a time in the future when uh, he'll pour out, God will pour out his Spirit on all flesh, sons and daughters will prophesy, uh, that that uh, daughters will dream dreams and sons will see visions and all these things are mentioned in in uh, uh, Joel chapter two. But one thing that's not mentioned in Joel two is speaking in languages. And of all the things that are mentioned in Joel two, none of them take place in Acts two. The only point of similarity is the pouring out of God the Holy Spirit. So what Peter is basically saying in this uh, extended uh, quotation here from Joel is that this coming of God the Holy Spirit is, is in keeping with how God is, has promised to work in, in the future. And so there's a connection there. The God, the Holy Spirit, from what we learn in the Old Testament, can do this kind of thing. And so he uses that to go on and talk about uh, the fact that, that uh, and apply this to uh, the, the message and the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth in verse, verse 22. So of all the things that he quotes, all the things that he cites, uh, prophecy, the signs in the heavens, the wonders in the heavens, the moon uh, turning into blood, and the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, none of those things happened in Acts 2. That's going to happen at the end of the tribulation. That's when that prophecy is actually fulfilled, is at the end of the tribulation. But Peter isn't saying this is that event. He's saying this is like that, and we can learn something 
uh, we can learn something from it in terms of the gospel. So he is explaining this. This is when the church begins in Acts 2. Now, the third point we'll save to next time. This is when uh, we go into what is known as the mystery doc, do, doctrine of the New Testament. This is an important concept to understand because what it tells us is that Israel in the Old Testament had no, they had no foreshadowing. They had no uh, predisposition to realizing that God was going to set them aside. They thought the Messiah would come and then they would go into the kingdom. There was no idea that there would be an intervening period of time, a parenthesis as some call it, between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. It was not revealed at all in the Old Testament. It was a mystery, unrevealed truth, and everything related to your life and my life as a Christian is based on this mystery doctrine. It's some of the most important material in all of Scripture, and we'll start looking at that next time. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things this evening and to reflect upon the beginning of the church, the uniqueness of the church, and the distinctives of the church. And we pray that God the Holy Spirit would use it to challenge us that we might maximize the assets, the privileges, the blessings that you have given us in this church age so that we might grow and advance in our spiritual life and glorify you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.